Can you guys still hear me? I can, I yeah. can hear you. Uh -huh. Yeah, we can definitely hear you. I can't believe with as many things as fun. you're doing right now, Daryl, that I've ever been able to get mine to work. I don't understand. Hi, I'm Paul Merriman, and uh, welcome to something new for the Merriman uh, Financial Education Foundation. Uh, we have decided after some recent Zoom broadcasts that uh, it would be great fun and we hope will be helpful to you uh, to do some Zoom Q&A sessions. And who better to do that with than the two guys who were there the day that we recorded, uh, I think it was May 9th, if I'm not mistaken, uh, for Choose FI and uh, Chris Pedersen, our Director of Research, uh, who uh, is uh, famous now for developing the two funds for life, and, uh, and Daryl Balls, who is our uh, Director of Analytics. And uh, if you wanna know how hard he works, uh, go to Best Advice and start opening up all of those links to table after table after table to try to help you make better investment decisions. So what we've got to work with today is a list of questions that came from those uh, folks that we were so happy to, to have with us. I think at one point we had as over 400 people with us uh, on, the, on the Choose FI and and, and by the way, it would, be, it would be totally unfair if we didn't mention that joining us there that day was Jennifer Ma, who works with Choose FI, and she did a great job uh, of, uh, of leading the pack. And for those of you who didn't see it, we will have a link in the notes to this, uh, uh, to this discussion uh, to that, I think about three hour or almost three and a half hour uh, uh, Zoom presentation. And by the way, also a lot of people are not going to be seeing this on a on a on a Zoom uh, format, but rather we'll be listening to a podcast. So uh, today we're not going to use a lot of tables that you have to look at. We might use one now and then, but but mostly I think people listening will be able to get the the, the value out of this uh, get together as those that are, are watching us. So what I have in, in my hand right here is about 25 questions. And I've been tasked by uh, Asia Griffin, our, our director of marketing, uh, to try to do this in an hour because she claims that uh, you all get uh, bored if we do this for too long. So we're gonna to try to get through these in an hour, and we've got a similar get together to, to, uh, to respond to the questions that came from the AAII presentation. That, by the way, was on the, it was on the same day as the Choose FI, and, uh, and we'll, we'll have a, a series of these. We wanna hear back from you whether you find this helpful. So let me get to work. And I'm going to, by the way, we didn't arrange these questions in any priority. This is kind of as they came uh, from the people who were watching. So let me start with uh, John, who asks, when investing in Vanguard mutual funds, what are the two funds for life you recommend? And obviously the, the, the genius behind uh, the two funds for life is uh, uh, gonna gonna take us uh, take us there, Chris. What are the two funds? Well, the the two funds for life it starts with a target retirement fund or a target date fund, and then it adds a, a fund of your choice. And we've modeled several different ones. The classic one is probably a small cap value fund. So if I was working with, um, with Vanguard and I was going to go for a target retirement fund, I would go to their website. I'm actually going to just take a quick peek over there. And I would look up, say, the Vanguard target retirement fund for 2050, if I was planning on retiring in 2050. 
That fund is VF, like Frank, IF, like Frank, X. And, um, you know, there's different retirement. There's, there's different tickers for the different age windows, right? So you'd pick that fund. And then you would add a small cap value fund like VBR. If you're going to stick with, VBR is actually an ETF, but you could find a, uh, a mutual fund at Vanguard that would be a small cap value fund as well. Our best in class recommendations are, are actually ETFs and they are, um, they're not always Vanguard. So, you know, we recommend uh, IJR uh, as small cap blend or IJS or SLYV as small cap value, for example. So it's really up to you to choose um, which second fund you're going to add to your target retirement fund. But um, yeah, that, that's it. It'd just be a target retirement fund and then a small cap value or large value or you, know, it, you, you pick how much, um, how much tilt you want, if you will, or how much risk you're willing to take. And we've modeled a lot of that on our website. But pick, why would they pick small cap value versus small cap blend? Oh, yeah. oh, okay. Well, um, so small cap value is going to give you uh, historically, uh, you know, more of a tilt towards two factors that um, deliver a premium. And so you've got, uh, if the future looks like the past, you have two things, you have a better chance at a higher return, and you also have uh, more diversification in terms of the kind of factors that are working for you, which history says gives you uh, more frequent good performance and, you know, kind of, mm -hmm. it, it, it's a form of diversification. So it's going to reduce some of the volatility. So small value, that's why we start there usually in terms of recommendations. But, um, you know, I, I encourage people to look at the work that we've done on the website under two funds for life, because it comes with some risk, right? Any added return is going to come with a little more risk. So uh, large value isn't going to have as deep a drawdowns typically as small value and large blend is going to have even less, right? So um, take a That's look great. and see what makes sense for you. Good. That's great. And uh, here's a question from Bill. How do you see, and he makes reference uh, to a, a U.S. total market index and a global uh, market index. Uh, how do you see uh, their performance going forward? Now, we could easily just say uh, something simple like we have no idea what the future will bring or the past is no guarantee of, of the future. But if, if you guys had to pick a number for future performance of what is basically, whether it's U.S. or U.S. and international, large cap growth. That's going to be the heavy hitter in those two big indexes. How would you see the likely future? Daryl, where would, where would you fall? Huh. I, I really would have no idea where, where it would go. I would say that, that you're so broadly diversified, though, that uh, you're going to capture most of what the world does, the U.S. and the world does in the future that way. And if the world does fine, you'll do fine. If the world doesn't do so fine, it almost doesn't matter what you have. I mean, yeah. it's all going to be, be uh, a little bit rough. So It is an unknown, but we do know that both of those funds have very little small cap and right. and not a whole lot of value so i would say that while i can't tell you what they will bring in terms of returns that they will still produce lower rates of return than we would if you up the ante in small and you up the ante in value but uh, i think if you want to do okay and be comfortable with the fact that you got a a bunch of really big companies that that uh, yeah, you'll probably do well, but it's about a fifty. I think fifty-five percent of the global is U.S. and about forty-five right. is uh, inter international. But but uh, well, obviously we don't know the future, right? Here's a uh, I I find this next question from Rocky. 
very interesting because this group of people that we were speaking to, those are folks who want to retire early. They want to retire in their 40s or their early 50s. They don't want to wait till they're 60 or 65 to retire. And, uh, and so Rocky says, for people taking early retirement, how does the current situation, situation affect the sequence of risk returns? And Daryl, tell us about the sequence of risk returns and, and what do you think about somebody walking into this uh, market that, uh, that could easily go down a considerable amount uh, and then today, by the way, as we're recording this, the market's up about 800 points. So uh, uh, maybe at the end of the day, nobody will care about the downside. But what is the sequence of returns? Well, sequence of returns risk is, is with us all the time, whether you see it or not. Um, in the last month or two here, the risk has shown up. And so uh, now is the time when whatever you have done in the past to set up your, your portfolio, your asset allocation, your glide path, uh, now is when it pays off. So proper asset allocation, fixed income asset allocation can help, help you in a time like this and protect you against a downside market. Um, if you're coming into retirement or, or early in retirement or coming up on retirement, um, there are several things you can do to help yourself. Uh, one of the one things you can do is is take a look at something that uh, Michael Kitsis, who's a, a financial advisor, has uh, talked about over the last few years, and that's called a bond tent, bond tent. What he means by that is you actually over allocate to bonds during what he calls the red red retirement zone, and that's the ten years before retirement and the fifteen years after. And and what you do in that time is you overbalance to bonds. Uh, because the problem is if you just retired and you go through something like we have now, um, it takes a big chunk out of your, your portfolio and uh, it can have an a everlasting impact on your ability to withdraw from that portfolio into the future. Uh, another thing you can do is oversave before you retire. And Paul has mm -hmm. mentioned this many, 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 many times. Um, in effect, what oversaving does is it lowers your withdrawal rate initial withdrawal rate. And so that's, that's one way to help mitigate the effect of a downturn in the market. You can do other things like delay social security if possible. Um, that will make your, your social security fixed income stream uh, larger. Um, you could put together a liability matching portfolio as Bill Bernstein says, and, and have, have your fixed income portfolio to take care of uh, whatever you think you're gonna have to have in the next five or 10 years and put your risk portfolio in the, in uh, put your rest of your money in a risk portfolio where you won't necessarily need it. Um, if you really are concerned about it, you could get a, a short term single premium annuity, immediate annuity, I suppose, to carry you through this, this period right here. Um, but uh, one of the things is that when things like this happen is people think, well, this time it's different, you know, so I need to do something different. Well, it's almost never true that it's different. Uh, and I don't think it's really different this time either. So if you think about it, to kind of put things in perspective, tough times have happened before. Um, in, the, in the early early part of, la of the last century, boy, that sounds odd to say that that way, but in the early part of the last century, in early in 29, 1929, if you would have retired, that would have been great. You'd have, you'd have been in Pat City right then. Uh, but what you didn't know was that coming right up on you quick was a, was a huge depression. There were bear markets in the late 30s and late 40s and, and a little thing called World War II in the early 40s. So all of those things went through, you went through, your portfolio went through. And even so, with, with all those things that were there, you could have started taking out 5% inflation adjusted from your portfolio and for the next 30 years, and, and you, would have, you would have had enough money to get you through those 30 years. Similar kind of thing happened in 1966. If you retired in 66, you had market stagnation in the early 70s. You had really debilitating inflation in the late 70s and early 80s. I was there, I lived through it. We used to get 10% raises every six months. That doesn't happen anymore, but 
it was bad. <laughs> and then you had, uh, there were or crashes and there was a big crash in 87 where the, I think the Dow lost 25% of its value in a day or something like that, Paul. Mm -hmm. You might remember that more than I would. 22. Yeah, it was interesting at work mm -hmm. that day. Um, but even so, the 30 years after that, you could have taken 4% adjusted for inflation for the next 30 years and you would have survived. Um, those two examples are, are examples of things that set rules, withdrawal rules, quote unquote, uh, like the 4% rule of thumb. Uh, were the, really problem. Bad, the really bad times are what set those things. Uh, any other yeah. year in the 90 years since, since 1930 or so, you could have taken out more than 4%, much more than 4% and been fine. Nobody knew that though at the time. But you had a question, Paul? Yeah, I can just hear these young people in their 40s. I think they're very young saying, yeah, Daryl, I heard you say 30 years, but I may have 50 or I may have 60 years that I need to, to worry about. Would you have any uh, piece of advice for them? Well, if you, if you have a longer term retirement, um, you can lower your withdrawal rate a little bit to begin with, but you don't have to lower it a lot to get to what's called a perpetual withdrawal rate. And that's where at the uh, perpetual withdrawal rate is a withdrawal rate that if you take it out um, at the end of your time, if you take out 5% or whatever it is, inflation adjusted every year, at the end of your time horizon, whatever it is, if it's 50 years, you have exactly the same number of dollars mm. as you started with. It may not be worth the same uh, because of inflation, but, but the inflation or the perpetual withdrawal rates, once you get out into time horizons beyond 30 years, 30, 40, 50, even 60 years, are really just a few tenths of a percent mm -hmm. less than what they are for the 30-year portfolio. So you could knock a half percent off and, and to, the, to those 4% rule of thumb uh, and, and do three and a half or 3.3 or something like that if, if you wanted to be more conservative. Uh, on the other hand, if you've oversaved to where you can take that lower rate like that to begin with, then you're then you're in a good situation. You know, the, um, the other thing about oversaving that comes to mind is it gives you the ability to economize when the market's down, right? Mm -hmm. So if you've right. oversaved, you, you might have an ideal withdrawal rate that lets you live the lifestyle you like, um, but you choose to cut it back in the years when the market's down because you don't want to sell low, so to speak, right? And right. that flexibility brings a lot of comfort. I, I know people who've just retired and they're going through this in the market that we're in. And mm -hmm. they're they're basically calm because you know they're they're able to live off much, much less than they planned to live off. And it it makes them feel okay about getting through this time. Yeah. Right. So so Chris, and, could I pin you down on your best guess? How much more do you think somebody should oversave and and qualify for this ability to uh, uh, to have more peace of mind? I mean, ten percent, twenty, fifty, a hundred. Well, if you've if somebody has oversaved by thirty three percent, then that means that they're effectively doing a three percent withdrawal rate, which is really conservative, right? So, so you've got an extra bucket of money that you can use for the future. So I think, you know, you've said double in the past and, and clearly double would be even nicer, mm -hmm. but I think even at, even at, uh, you know, one and a half to one and a third times what you really need in retirement, that's, that's a huge difference over just having enough. Because if you have just right. enough and the market goes down 20%, now you have 80% of enough, right? That's right. Uh, where if you've got 33%, the vast majority of drawdowns aren't going to take you below where you have enough. So I, I think I, I think 33% is kind of a lower bound for me. Yeah, That's great. Daryl, do you want to well, add anything else? Yeah, I would. Just one, one thing. As Chris mentioned, I think, you know, being able to reduce spending is, is good. Uh, and that's one way to approach it. But I think when people are thinking about retiring and getting into the point to where they're going to have to withdraw, uh, 
funds, make distributions from the retirement portfolio, just like you, you should have an investment policy statement about how you're going to invest. I believe you should have a withdrawal policy statement about mm -hmm. how you're going to take money out and what you're going to do if, if things go bad during, during uh, the time you're trying to do that. Uh, identify things like what kinds of, what, elements of your discretionary spending. As Chris mentioned, economize on living expenses. Maybe you can defer some big expenses. Maybe instead of getting a new car, you decide to, to fix the one you've got. Um, and, and if you document those things and put them in writing, then when bad stuff happens, you can go back and read that and say, yeah, I remember when I said that, and yeah, I think that's, I think that's what I need to do. Uh, and, and one of the key things to remember is that Bear markets have almost always been followed by strong recoveries, recoveries, strong recoveries in some cases. So being patient and flexible and staying the course will really, really serve you well when it comes time to go through a market like we're going through now. If you had the right course in the first place. Right. And the people I worry about are the people who think they've got it right, but they've got more risk uh, in that portfolio. Well, let me move along. Great work, guys. Um, here's a, a question from Dylan. Uh, have, have your various allocations, referring to the, the 10 fund and the four fund and the two funds, are they uh, set up as pies at M1 Finance? And what is the easy way for people to get started at uh, M1. Why don't, Chris, why don't you take this one since you uh, put those sure. pies together? Yeah, so if you go to Paul's website um, and you look up at the top, there's a little pull down that says M1 and Motif. And if you click on M1 Finance, it will take you to the page that has our pies and you have to kind of scroll down to the bottom, but down there you'll find uh, a whole bunch of ultimate buy and hold pies, all value, all small cap value. Um, let's see what else we got in there. We even have some target retirement funds. So we don't have everything, but we have quite a few and they're good shortcuts to get you started. Um, what, what M1 does, it's super simple, is once you set up your account, you have the ability to set up an allocation and you can have lots of these different allocations. That's why they call them pies. Nobody should just have one pie, right? I'd like to have lots of pies in my fridge. So, yeah. um, but you set up your pie and once you've set that up, you can set up a rule to have an automatic contribution going in. Could be as little as $10, um, could be a hundred dollars, could be monthly, quarterly. And whenever that money comes in, as soon as it's over $10, uh, it will automatically trigger a purchase and the purchase will go towards the pieces of your pie that are most underrepresented um, until they're, they're back to the desired allocation. So it's constantly trying to rebalance, if you will, and get you back to your desired allocation and it's automatic, it's in the background. You, you literally set this thing up, it's on autopilot and walk away. Now, if you want to, you can go in every year and click a little button to say rebalance and, and reset everything and that'll trigger a purchase for the following day. Uh, it's free, there's no commissions. Um, so it's, it, it's really designed for a buy and hold investor who wants to choose the appropriate investing strategy for them and stick with it and be disciplined about ignoring the market ups and downs and just let the money flow in. So it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I, I, I really like it. And I've, I've pointed a lot of young people at it and uh, I think one of my nephews is using it. And uh, you know, I have accounts there as well that I use for testing and for setting up our pies and it's been great, it's super easy to use. Yeah. And would you uh, just take a second and, and talk, uh, about the the partial share purchase and sale? Oh yeah, that's a really good point. You know, if, if some of you may have been tripping over the fact that with only $10, I can make a purchase of Paul's ultimate buy and hold portfolio, right? It's got 10 slices and they're all ETFs and normally you have to buy ETFs a share at a time. But the way M1 does it, um, they do fractional shares. So if you need a, you know, a 10th of a share of one and, you know, 
14 hundredths of a share of another and, uh, you know, a third of a share of another, it, it, they'll do that for you, which is just super slick, right? Um, so that, because you're not waiting for those chunks of a whole, a whole fund, it means that you can achieve your desired allocation much sooner, right? You can achieve your desired allocation with a $100 investment or a $200 investment. You don't have to have thousands of dollars. That's that's great. All right. Oh, did you want to add anything to that, Daryl? I think no. Chris covered oh. it. Okay, good, good. Uh, okay, uh, from Nikki. Um, what information on your website should I consult to determine what my distribution between equities and bonds should be? Is there a rule of thumb for specific ages. Well, Daryl, since you put uh, all of these tables, the fine tuning tables, the, the distribution tables together, et cetera, uh, what would your guidance be to Nikki about that combination of equities and fixed income? Well, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think the fine tuning uh, tables are a perfect place to start. They're on the website under uh, best advice on the homepage at paulmerriman.com. And if, when you go there, you can see that, that they have fine tuning, fine tuning tables set up for many, many different portfolios. The S&P 500, the ultimate buy and hold worldwide, uh, the four fund combo portfolio. So, depending on what kind of portfolio you have, you can look at, at the fine tuning tables and see what they show. And what they'll show you is that as your asset allocation between fixed income and stocks varies, you can see how your returns vary, uh, how, this, how the standard deviation varies or volatility, how much up and down uh, you'll see in your, your portfolio over time, uh, what the worst drawdowns were, how much, uh, as Paul likes to say, how much can he guarantee you're going to lose at some point? Um, and, and all that information is at the bottom of those tables. And so you can get a chance to, to get a feel for how those things vary and, and how much your, your reward versus risk uh, is for each different type of allocation uh, or portfolio. Um, as far as how should, how should that change uh, as a function of your age, I'm not the expert in that, but, but to first order, I would think that you're kind of following what, uh, what the splits between a, a, a target date fund might be in terms of their fixed income and equity. You can look at what Chris has in the, in the uh, two funds for life and sort of see how that changes over time between fixed income and, and uh, equities. Chris, would you want to, expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I think there's two ways for people to figure out their fixed income equity allocation. The first one is the one that you recommended, Daryl, and I, I, I think for a lot of people, that's the, the right place to start. What amount of a drawdown are you willing to tolerate and still be able to sleep at night and not be fretting about your investments, right? That's a that's a hard question to answer, but it's a really important one for, for investors to answer. And the more experience we have with investing, the easier it is to answer because we've lived through certain yeah. things and we know what we can tolerate, right? I think the other way to look at it, um, and this will tie back to your comment about retirees, is the, the bucket approach, right? Um, when you invest in equities, you have the chance that in a short period of time, they're going to lose a lot of value. And hopefully in a long period of time, they'll gain it back and more, right? Well, if you have short-term financial commitments, if you're going to buy a house, buy a car, you know, pay for an education, um, then you'd like to have some money in an emergency fund at the very least, and possibly in a bucket that is more conservatively invested in fixed income because it's less likely to lose its value in the short term, right? So that bucket strategy, as you approach retirement, helps explain why the, the fixed income allocation goes up. Because up until you retire, your short-term financial needs have largely been met by a paycheck, right? You know, you've, right. you've had money coming in regularly. 
But the day you retire, you're on the hook, not just for you know the next month, but for the next year, the next two years, right? And so right at that point in time, it's really good for people to be thinking, well, I, you know, how much money do I need in the year or the two years or the three years? And like Paul, I think you, you know, you go to uh, a short term uh, fixed income fund with the money that you're going to use for the entire next year, right? Every year. And you have another fixed income bucket that's quite large that would probably meet your needs for seven to 10 years, right? Right. And then you have your equities, which are longer term. So I think either strategy works, but especially for over savers, that bucket strategy can help rationalize things um, once they're nearing retirement because they, they, at that point in time, they should have a pretty good handle on what their behavioral capabilities are for tolerating a downturn. And so they could look at it that way. But then if they've oversaved, they may have money that's for next generation and they want to put that more at risk and, and invest it. Um, you know, I, that may be a larger percentage than traditionally would go into fixed income um, because they're oversavers. So I think both strategies are helpful, both the, the kind of the psychological strategy of looking at the drawdowns and the fine tuning tables and the bucket strategy. And I think for a lot of people, uh, our work is basically about helping do-it-yourself investors. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, even do-it-yourself investors on this topic might want to sit with a professional for an hour or two, uh, not just to find the answer for one part of the couple, but to find the right answer for both both people. because. Very often they have different levels of ideas of how much we should spend and how much we should save and how much risk we're willing to take. Uh, John has a, a, hey, a, a... Hey, Paul, before you go on to John, can we go back up to Jack? We had that oh. question from Jack up there that I was really interested in answering. <laughs> oh, oh yes, thank you. No, it was such a short question. I, I missed it. Yeah, absolutely. I love this question. Uh, Jack asks, um, what would have been the difference in returns for the two fund portfolio versus the 10 fund portfolio? And you might want to just take a second and, and talk about how those two are constructed. Yeah. So the two, well, let's see, I'm going to assume that the two fund portfolio he's talking about here is two funds for life. Cause I get that question right. all the time. Yep. So uh, two funds for life is where we combine a target date fund with a second fund, traditionally small cap value that is scaled with age so that it effectively goes to zero around when you retire. Um, but it's much, much higher when you're young. And, and the algorithm we usually start with, or the, the equation is, 1.5 times your age goes into the target date fund and the rest goes into small cap value. So at the age of 20, 1.5 times your age would be 30% going into the target date fund and 70% going into small cap value. And so it's kind of, that one's hard to back test because you have to try a whole bunch of different times and retirement ages in combination. And, and you can read on the website how we do it. But I've recently been working on an apples to apples comparison where I back test the 10 funds, the ultimate buy and hold, which is 10 equal slices of uh, large cap blend, large cap value, small cap blend, small cap value, REITs, emerging markets, large cap, and then international, all the same ones as the US, right? Mm -hmm. And I think um, if I do a quick share here, let's see if I can pull this off. I've got to come back over here. I can give you a sneak peek at that analysis. Let's uh, see if this works. You got my attention. <laughs> All right, share. So are you seeing this? Yep. All right, cool. Oh, so yeah. uh, this is preliminary work. It's kind of, like I said, it's a sneak peek. Um, but the, the way I came at the question was to say, what amount of fixed income or bonds would I need to have in the ultimate buy and hold portfolio to deliver about the same expected outcome as you would get out of a two fund for life strategy? And um, 
for those of you watching the video, this is kind of a complex picture. So I'll jump to the answer first and then I'll come back and talk about what you can see in the picture. So if you invested $10,000 per year on a monthly basis, so that's about $833 a month, and you increased it with inflation and you did that for 40 years, starting at age 25, retiring at 65, using that two fund for life strategy, the median end balance is about two and a half million dollars in in that's real that's a real end balance so it's uh, what you'd have in spending power not not an inflated number and if i do the same thing but i do it with the ultimate buy and hold with a 70 30 70 percent in stocks and 30 percent in bonds it comes out right at about the same amount, $2.4 million, two point, yeah, two, two, yeah, we'll just call it close enough, $2.4 million. So basically what that says is not surprisingly because the target date fund has fixed income in it and that's going up with time, uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't deliver as much return over the long haul as an all equity ultimate buy and hold would, um, or at least it wouldn't historically. But if you have this 70% uh, equity, 30% fixed income, they end up at about the same place. But there are some differences, right? So the ultimate buy and hold doesn't change the allocation over time, which means you go up to about a 40 to 43% drawdown, worst case drawdown that you might experience at any point in time. And that goes all the way through to retirement where instead, if you look at the, the uh, two fund for life strategy, it goes to a higher peak drawdown amount of about 52%. But by the time you're at retirement, it's down to about 33%. So the, you know, that's the advantage of a target retirement fund or um, any two fund for life strategy is that it's, it's risk managed, right? You have this risk declining with age. Um, there's some other interesting things on this chart, uh, you know, like the percentage of time that you spend hitting new highs versus time in drawdown and the target, the target date approach with the two funds for life is hitting new highs about 30% of the total experience. And the ultimate buy and hold is actually hitting new highs about 44% of the time. So that's, that's a little bit better, you know, and if uh, you don't care about the fact that you're going to have a higher risk entering retirement, you know, maybe that's an okay approach for you, right? So uh, for those of you watching the video, this is a sneak peek at stuff to come. I'm not going to explain the rest of the chart because it's all preliminary, but um, there'll, be, there'll be more of this. If you have any comments for me about what you like or don't like about it, I'd love to hear because uh, I'm still working on it. So does that answer the question, Paul? That, that's, that's great, Chris. I think that uh, I have lots of questions, but that's to do in private. <laughs> I mean, this is really exciting stuff, I think. And uh, uh, I, there are a lot of people who use the 10 fund strategy. The question is, is, is there a way to attach a glide path fixed income along with that 10 fund strategy that would be similar to attaching? Well, we, we a, did that, right? We, we Effectively, we did that in the Merriman aggressive target retirement uh, yes the target exactly. date fund exactly. right so so if somebody wants to be ultimate you know 100 percent diy on their target retirement fund and they want to tilt more towards small in value in the early years and maybe they want a different u.s versus international allocation they even want to control that um, we have on our website um, the calculators that'll let you set yeah. that all up so yeah. Um, if somebody wants the ultimate target retirement fund uh, or target date fund, we have the article and the calculator for it. That's, yeah. that, that's great. Okay. Uh, back here to how much of your portfolio and in international stocks. This is the one I thought would only take a second. I, I, I will tell you that the academics would probably vote as a group for something close to 50-50. Uh, I think that's uncomfortable for a lot of people who are U.S. investors. And, uh, and so we have shown results in all of the tables that, uh, that Daryl has put together. I'm talking about 
both at the fine-tuning level as well as at the distribution level uh, with the variety of combinations of fixed income and these equities. Uh, those are all done both 50-50 and 70-30, 70 U.S., 30, fixed, uh, 30 international. And so you can at least see, by the way, not too much difference in the return, a little more a little more money if you're 50-50, but it also comes in some ways with another level of risk, and that's your risk of having the ability to stay the course uh, over those times that internationals are lagging uh, the U.S. Okay, here is one from, uh, and if anybody wanted to weigh in there, now's your chance. Well, what are you, Chris? What's your combination in your own portfolio, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot? What is the equity allocation? How much U.S., how much international? Uh, we, so we have in our policy statement a goal of being between 20 and 30% international. Mm -hmm. And that was driven by um, a balance of me explaining the academic recommendations to my wife and her explaining her U.S.-centric biases to me. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's great. You know, you have to you. you have to compromise. You have to reach yes. a point that you both can be comfortable with it, right? Yes. So yeah, we're we're between twenty and thirty percent, and that's in our policy statement. And when we rebalance every year, uh, it's actually closer to every year or two. Uh, a lot of times, I'm too busy with you to rebalance, which is okay. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's great. And Daryl, what about you? What's what what's the the r real life portfolio that you use? We're about 60 US, 40 international. Yeah. Uh, the one thing that, that if, if you're going to choose to not invest in international or not invest or, or invest predominantly uh, in US, I think the one thing to be considerate of or to consider is is how much of why you're doing that is, is a home country bias or a confirmation mm -hmm. bias of what you're preconceived notions might be not not to not to say anything about your wife chris but, <laughs> but well, well but actually yeah, she yeah, brought you, up two things she she brought up home country bias which is mm -hmm. definitely true but she also brought up uh, cr um, currency concerns exactly yes that's true that yeah. i was just going to get there you're right that is a, that is a concern yeah um but the the home country bias is is an example of of what might what some people might think of as a behavioral finance uh, error is yeah, that, I, I, I even New Zealanders that. think that they're going to do better than the rest of the world. Okay, and uh, and so they invest much more in their own country than they do in in the rest of the world. Um, well, and it, it, the counter argument I brought to the table was the I think the most powerful one is this idea that you want to avoid single points of failure, right, in any design. Right. You and I are both engineers, so that's a little geek speak. <laughs> but um, it, if you tilt very heavily towards the United States, as good as our history has been, um, you know, you can look at other countries where everything went south in one country for a period of time, and uh, you know, ninety percent plus of the equity, sometimes even a hundred percent, was lost, right? Mm -hmm. And so, by diversifying internationally, at least you guard against that, right? You guard against that. Uh, yeah. The classic one, point failure. classic example of that recently is Japan. Yeah. Right. Yep. So. Uh, okay. Um, we are 50-50. And I, by the way, I, I don't know whether I properly included my wife in that decision. Uh, so <laughs> I've got to go back and review the notes. But you inspire me. Okay. From Terry. Uh, what are your thoughts on small cap value going forward? Uh, Terry adds, I fear total stock market index is too growth cap weighted, uh, uh, looking at a 20 year horizon. Uh, and, uh, and in terms of risk and volatility, I think uh, in, when you discuss, and, and Chris, I'm gonna throw this one to you, um, what, 
your feelings about small cap value for the future and not just the next year or two, but the next 20 years? Well, the academics would say, um, and, and the history that they rely on says that small cap value is likely to outperform if you can invest with discipline and endure some periods of underperformance. Mm -hmm. And and I haven't seen anything to say that that's not the case. I think it's important though that you also believe in the rationale for any investment strategy. And for me, the way I like to think about small cap value is um, in the ter in terms of a forest, right? So if I walked into, if I was a forester and I was growing lumber, and I walked into a forest and somebody said, you know, you can have a part of this forest. You can own part of it. Uh, you know, would you like to own these, you know, a few big trees that are here in the middle for the next 50 years? Or would you like to own a bunch of these little trees that are around the edge um, that this other guy just got tired of, you know, and didn't want to hold. I, it's, it's easy for me to see that the little trees are going to grow faster, right? Mm -hmm. It's easy for me to see that the things that are recently out of favor have a chance of coming back into favor. Um, but I think that that's, you know, it's important that you figure out a way to believe in a philosophy. And I believe in that philosophy. I think if I buy things that are cheaply priced today, I'm going to do better than buying the ones that are high priced. And I think if I buy things that are small and not spending too much, right, which is the large, the small cap growth is spending too much, right, but companies that are really giving it a good shot and are small, that I'm going to do better in the future. They got a better chance to get big than something that's already big. So, so I, I believe in the philosophy and that's going to give me the ability to stick with it when times are hard. Yeah. Um, so I, I feel good about its long-term prospects, but um, I also don't fool myself to think that it's going to be easy. I feel like I'm going to have to earn the return that comes from that tilt by tolerating periods of underperformance. So if you thought about your kids, uh, you'd, be, you'd be more comfortable with them having more in small cap value than you do? I, but for the first investments of all of my children, I put them 100% in small cap value and then sat them down and had a long conversation about why this might be hard, but why it would be worthwhile. Terrific. And um, some of my nephews also invested in small cap value. And I still remember getting the phone call about a year and a half later of, hey, wait a minute, I would have done better in the S&P 500. I'm thinking about trading out a small cap value and having to have a follow-up conversation about, you know, well, if you want the returns of large cap blend, if you want the returns of the S&P 500, you should invest in the S&P 500. And I, I think uh, at least one of my nephews has diversified as a result mm. of that. And that's okay. That's yeah. okay, right? It'll be what he can live with. If they're good savers, that at that age is the big deal. And then right. uh, get them in equities. Yeah. Daryl, would you add anything on that one? Um, the only thing I would add is that, that if someone is considering small cap value, that they, they realize that they may have to wait for it, like yeah. Chris said. Um, and, but a good way to see how you, can, how you have been rewarded in the past for being patient is to go take a look on Paul's site under 90 years of performance. It's under the best advice uh, tab or, uh, drop down on the homepage. And take a look at the, at the tables four and six, I think they are for the 15 and 20 year periods and see how small cap value did compared to the other four major asset classes. Uh, yeah. And also compared to the four fund combo for that matter. But, uh, you know, you need yeah. to be, you need to be careful because like Larry Sudrow, Swedrow is fond of saying, you know, you should never take more risk than you have the ability, the willingness or the need to take. So if you have the ability and the willingness and don't need the outperformance to live, to live in retirement, you don't need it out. You don't need it to show up necessarily. Then go for it. Yeah. Terrific. Uh, Jessica says, uh, you mentioned the impact of setting aside a dollar a day for a child early on. Uh, where is the best place uh, to be doing this? And then a question mark after 529s. 
uh, Uniform Trust to Minors Act, uh, or the Bank of Mom. I like that. Well, I'll take this one briefly because uh, this is something I have had so much fun sharing with parents and grandparents and motivating many of them to take this, this step. Uh, what I have recommended, if I had to recommend one thing, if the money is for the long, long term, I mean, that if, if it's you're putting money away for a, a newborn child, for example, and the idea is to have it not only accumulate and be worth something uh, when they're going to college, but you're thinking beyond college. You're thinking about what about the possibility of something to where maybe they want to buy a house, but what if you want to go beyond the house? What if you want to go to retirement? Uh, because I think about what young people today are going to have to do to have enough money to retire on, given what little we know about the past and the impact, for example, of inflation. So the strategy that I would recommend is the money goes into an account, could be one dollar a day, but I would do it with a check every year for for three sixty five and then and and then what I would do is I'd put that money into an asset class that is likely over the next well let's say in essence all the years of of, of getting to the point of retirement, but I would start with small cap value, and every year you would do that, put that three sixty five away into a small cap value fund in your name, not in that child's name. Because I want you to maintain control of that money. Yes, you may have to pay a few bucks in, uh, in taxes along the way to do it this way, but I think it's absolutely worth the few extra bucks. When that child has started to earn some money, and I want you to get that advice from somebody who gives tax advice, I don't, but I know a lot of people start putting money into a Roth IRA for a child that in fact the money is made working. It can be mowing lawns, it could be babysitting, it could be doing things that even could be for the family. Again, ask an accountant how you do that properly. And you keep putting money into that Roth IRA account until the money that you've been putting in is gone. So you have the early years. Let's say you did this for 21 years. You'd have the 365 going in every year into an account in your name. And then the, and the child starts earning some money and now you start taking the money out. Well, who knows what return you're going to get on that investment uh, and up until the point you start taking it out, hopefully a good return. Then eventually that money is in fact, it, it, is, it is spent. Uh, and it is spent by investing the money, okay? So the, the uh, impact of this is a huge amount of money for a child by about age 21 that if by the time they're 30 is moved over into the Roth IRA, you have potentially a multi-million dollar portfolio. And if you read the article, How to Turn $3,000 into $50 million, it's real simple. One, you assume you put it into an equity asset class that compounds at 12%. Where can we find 12%, you're asking? Well, I might ask, where can you find 10%? And you might answer, well, in an S&P 500 fund. And I'd say, right, that is a possibility, as that has been approximately the return of the last 92 years. I would say where the 12% might come from would be from small cap value. Now it has paid a premium over the last 92 years that's more like 5%, but I'm thinking if we could get 2%, that money will grow, and then when they get into retirement, they take money out. It could be as much as $20 million when you look at the study, and when they die at 95 and pass along more to the family, it could be as much as $30 million, all because somebody helped plant those small trees, as Chris was talking about, when the child was young. But do it in your name, move it directly from there into the Roth IRA, do everything you know to keep that kid from cashing that out. That's the biggest risk of the future of that investment, 
is the child, not the stock market. All right. Let me see what else. I, I should give Daryl and Chris a chance to add to that if you wish to. Well, yeah, I was just going to say, uh, if it's in your name it, and it's not a trust account that you're setting up, M1 would be a simple place to do it because oh, okay. you could you could literally have, you know, a monthly transfer of ten dollars, twenty dollars. Uh, it doesn't, you know, you can set that up as an automatic transfer into the account, and wow. it'll uh, it'll automatically allocate it, you know, and do the purchases, and so I, and it'll automatically reinvest the div dividends along the way. So I. Okay. I think I think uh, since it is in your name and it's not a trust account, uh, that's a that's an interesting option. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And I do hope our our uh, viewers and listeners will take the time to read your articles that are under the ETF link on our uh, uh, on our website because uh, uh, it will not only d discuss the strategies but how you built them. There's some great information there. Thanks, thanks to you, Chris. Okay, here is from Mike. Is values fall from grace related to the increase in the influence of mutual funds and ETFs? If so, should we focus more on market dynamics and average returns since mutual funds and ETFs gain their influence? Uh, I was a little confused, a little bit confused by the question, but you read it. Did you did you have did you have a direction you would go from what you read, Chris? You know, I I think value cut has histor historically come and gone in terms of its performance. So uh, you, you know, and I'm not sure anybody really knows why. Um, you know, things come and they fall in and out of favor at different points in time. Uh, explaining it is like explaining the ups and downs of the stock market. People will write it up every day. They'll tell a story, but nobody really, really knows. If they did, they would have figured it out a day ahead and become really rich, right? <laughs> yes. So, yes. so I'm hesitant to uh, stick my oar in the water on trying to explain it either. You know, I, I think that mutual funds and ETFs have made it easier for people to invest in what used to be somewhat esoteric ways. And so in a sense, that does make the market more competitive. And if we look at the history of the market, there are some really long-term trends that are visible as a result of things being more competitive and more global. Uh, international is more correlated with U.S., for example, U.S. equities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think the return premiums are a little bit less than they used to be, right? Uh, that doesn't mean they're not there, um, yeah. but it does mean that maybe it'll take a little bit more patience going forward, you know, or maybe we're just in a period of time where, you know, it's been a long a long dip for value and we're about to experience the up. One of the things that I notice when I look back at these discontinuities is, is the, and this is true of market downturns, it's true of uh, premiums for factors, it's true of US versus international, the corrections don't tend to happen smoothly over long periods of time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the U.S. international differences in returns, if you look back, they happen at discre discrete points in time. Mm -hmm. They'll track each other for a really long time and then boom, you know, it's like if you weren't in the market for that month, you missed yeah. the return, right? And I think the same thing is true of these, these premiums for factors. You know, if, you, if you're patient and you're willing to stay the course, you'll be there when it arrives. But if you're fickle, and you happen to be out at the wrong time, you may miss the whole return. Well, and I and, and what uh, Daryl said about that uh, article that's under best advice on the homepage at, uh, at uh, paulmerriman.com, uh, the nine decade study, you can actually see the ups and the downs yep. of large cap and small cap and blend and, and value and, and stocks and, 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 and bonds. And so uh, it's not like this is a new situation. Here is what confuses me. I'm constantly getting this question about value. 
that value has out has underperformed the S and P 500 recently. If we look at the last 20 years, the S and P 500 has compounded at less than a six percent rate of return. What are we supposed to do with that? Stop investing in the S and P 500. The people who 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 made it through that 10 year terrible return of an annual loss of about 1% from 2000 through 2009, they eventually got rewarded in the last 10 years. But, but it is a difficult part of investing. Why do we trust some things to be okay for the long term and, and not others? So that's the challenge. Well, there's, there's a behavioral finance bias we all have that, you know, recency bias. Yep. And I think that's the one that's coming to play here, right? Is that we, we remember how great the S&P 500 was for the last few years. Mm -hmm. We don't remember how bad it was back in the early 2000s. It's just not human nature, right? It's not the way we're wired. And Daryl, are you wired to answer anything here on that question? <laughs> Performance? Um, I, I think a lot, of, a lot of the disappointment in small cap value comes from recency bias, as you guys are mentioning. And so the fact that, that people don't tend to don't remember or tend to to minimize the decade between 2000 and 2009 or 10 is, is just, it's, it's what, it's what people do. Um, They don't remember the bad times. And uh, that, that I think is, is where you have to have a little bit longer term view. Um, Even if you, and if you're young, that sometimes that long term view goes back beyond where you were even, aware of what was going on. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's a difficult thing to do sometimes Mm -hmm. since you didn't experience it. Right. By the way, I just looked at my watch. Have we been recording for more than an hour? Uh, We're coming up on about an hour, I think. Are we? Okay. Okay. I just uh, lost control there. Um, John says, if you're already retired, what target date fund do you choose? Do you choose the target date fund of the year you retired or what? What, what do you do, Chris? Yeah, the, the year that's as close to when you retired as possible. And if you retired a long time ago, that's probably gonna be a 2020 fund or a 2015 fund or 2010 or something, cause they haven't been around that long, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but yeah, you would choose, if you're gonna try and implement two funds for life in retirement, uh, you would choose the fund closest to the year you retired and also look for one where the allocation is uh, changing and managed through retirement, just not, not just to retirement, Mm -hmm. right? So um, typically they will continue to decrease risk a little bit into the first years of retirement. And um, you, you can tell that way. Okay. That's, that's, that's great. And you, and by the way, if people will just watch that uh, on that choose FI date uh, that we recorded back in the, uh, what on the ninth was it or ninth or eleventh? Yep. Yeah, I think it was the ninth. Ninth, okay. Uh, you you do a uh, discussion about not just to retirement, but what people can be doing after retirement and choosing funds. And I thought you did a terrific job of of giving oh, people choices uh, depending on on risk risk re- and reward kinds of uh, needs. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is uh, your asset allocations are used by many people to create the path to the retirement they've envisioned. Do you suggest adjusting these allocations as you near retirement age, much like you would with a target date fund? Or do you select one portfolio based on your risk tolerance and write it out the entire way. Uh, why don't you start that one, Chris, and then Daryl can weigh in. You know, um, you could you could do it either way. I I, right. I think that for 
most people, they're, they're probably going to underestimate the discomfort they feel right at retirement. Mm -hmm. Um, At least I did, you know, I, I, it's a big change. And so that's why we sought some financial planning help at that point in time. We reduced our risk in terms of our portfolio a little bit at that point in time. Mm -hmm. And then as we've been retired for a period of time, we've gotten more confident and more comfortable and, and things have moved on. So, um, I think for a lot of people, it's going to make sense that they do some kind of an adjustment around then. And as you recommended, Paul, talking to a financial planner is a really good way to add some confidence and also some prudence, right? Because Mm -hmm. it helps you avoid making mistakes or being blindsided by something you missed. And so we we found, I, I, I can hard, it's hard for me to imagine a more valuable time in life to talk to a financial planner than when you're going from having living on the income that comes in every month to living off your savings. You know, it's just such a big change. It it seems like a great time to do it. Yeah. Good for you. And Daryl, you've done, you've been through it. Well, I had a different experience than Chris. Um, I worked for a company that provided me with a pretty good pension. So I had zero worries when I retired, when I walked out that day, but for others, who may not be in that situation, be fortunate enough to be in that situation, it can be a stressful time. And so, like we mentioned earlier, you, you can adjust your, your allocations as you approach retirement and then beyond uh, to help mitigate some of these things like we're going through now. We talked about that earlier with the bond tent or using a liability matching profile or, or various other things. Um, we have the custom TDF calculator that Chris built and um, put on the site under best and best advice target date funds. And you can, you can play with that to look at what your allocation should be, uh, how you might want to design your own glide path. Um, we basically stuck pretty much with the same asset allocation we had. And we've gone through some ups and downs uh, in the last few years, not because of anything the market's done, but because we have repositioned things uh, to take, take into consideration what we want to do with some of those funds in the future. So there are all kinds of, of considerations when you adjust your allocations as you get near retirement age. Um, and it's, it's, uh, we have on the website, uh, a lot of things that can help you gain insight into what those uh, decisions might, might do for you. I'm curious, Daryl, um, you've done a lot of work in the last couple of years uh, preparing for your money to, uh, to do a lot of good for, uh, for others. Uh, was that on the agenda when you retired or where in the, that process did you start to turn more and more to thinking about what you do for others after you're gone? Um, it was in the back of my mind for, for, many years, several years mm-hmm. before I retired. Um, I, I was unsure even back before I knew when I was going to retire or how much I thought I would have to have to retire. And then um, once I had reached that, that fork in the road, um, then after I'd been retired for a year or two, I finally decided that, you know, I, I thought about doing this. I might as well sit down and, and go ahead and do it. And so to work through that process was interesting. Um, and so, uh, it, but, it, but the other thing it did in order to accomplish what I wanted to do, it forced me to think about long-term allocation and, and placement of, of different, uh, funds, different asset classes in my different accounts in tax deferred and tax free, um, and taxable. So, so it can be a focusing, uh, event or focusing process. You know, that's one of the questions that down here somewhere somebody asked about, about uh, for example, small cap value. Uh, where, where would you put that in a portfolio? Where would you put your bonds? As long as you open that gate, why don't you go ahead and comment on that placement, asset class placement? Um, what, uh, I'm not sure it's... I really don't have a lot of experience in that because I had a lot of different things uh, locked in place when I retired. But in general, I would want to put the assets that have the higher expected return in the place that has the least tax liability. 
So I would put it in, put those kinds of things like small cap value, for example, in a Roth, um, where you will never pay taxes on what should be uh, eventually an overperformance or an outperformance uh, gain. Um, bonds create throw off taxable income. So uh, I would tend to put those in a tax deferred place or even depends, even a taxable account if it's the right kind of bonds. Um, but uh, like a tax exempt bond. For right. Example. Yes. Right. Exactly. Sorry. Um, we, we used to have bonds in our taxable account. And then when we went through this redistribution process, thought about how things were working. Uh, now they are all in my tax deferred accounts. So uh, that's yeah. That's Chris, what, what about do. you on that topic? Placement. I, I, I think I agree with Daryl, only he's thought about it more than me. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, here's one for you, Chris. Momentum and quality are additional factors that historically produced outsized returns. Did you consider adding index funds that track these factors to the ultimate portfolio? So I've looked a lot at momentum and quality as factors, and I use them as part of my selection criteria for the funds that we put into the best in class ETFs for the ultimate buy and hold. So if there, for example, is a small cap value fund that has higher quality um, and one that has lower quality um, exposure as a factor in the past, I'm going to pick the one that has higher quality. And, Define quality, if you would, just so. Uh, so quality is, it, uh, it's usually defined as um, some kind of financial metrics, like level of investment, right? Companies that uh, uh, spend a lot of the money that comes in versus companies that are more, more prudent, uh, you know, or companies that have a higher gross margin um, on the things mm -hmm. that they sell would be higher quality. Mm -hmm. um, there's different ways to measure it, just like there are different ways to measure value. Mm -hmm. um, but I use the Portfolio Visualizer, and it gives me the ability to look at the history of the exposure to the quality factor as, as defined. I use the AQR data set usually as a reference. So um, I, I, I couldn't really tell you I have a strong preference for one definition of quality over another. I like the AQR data set because it goes back a long time and because it seems to be academically well-grounded. So that's the one that I use. Um, it, what I've found when I look for funds that are specifically tuned around quality or around momentum is that they don't have, there's not as much historical um, proof of performance. Um, in particular, momentum has a lot of trading that has to go on to stay with the funds that have been winning recently. And so if I look at the fund histories for funds that are specifically just about momentum, what you find is that they underperform what they would have been expected to deliver based on what academic research says by two, three, four percentage points per year. Mm. It's, mm. it's substantial. So the promise of a high return is very high, but the realized return premium seems quite a bit lower. And so because of that, I don't look specifically for momentum funds but because momentum is negatively correlated with value, I look for momentum in, for example, the large cap blend fund or the small cap blend fund or the international large cap blend fund. And I try to pick funds that have a little bit of exposure to momentum so that overall in the portfolio, we get that momentum factor working for us a little bit, but we don't pay too much to get it, right? Okay. And we do the same thing on quality. We try and get the quality factor working for us where it can, but we don't pay, pay too much to get it. And, you know, I'll, I'm sure I'll revisit this as there's more time in history, but so far there's just, there's not as much evidence that those factors on their own are as uh, efficient to invest in as the small factor, the value factor. Yeah. And ever so quickly, the three factors that you think 
are the drivers of the premium that you're looking for? Well, I'll give you, I'll give you four. I think oh. in, the funds, in the funds that we use, the primary four factors are first the market market mm. risk, right? So the market is the engine for almost all of the portfolios. In fact, I would say all of the portfolios we recommend. The market is what over the long haul is gonna deliver you the greatest return. The second one is gonna be um, you know, fixed income factors, which are, uh, let's see, what is its term? And um, it's effectively Quality. default risk quality, right? It's yeah. default risk, right? Mm -hmm. And so the fixed income part that you put with the market factor, those two in combination with rebalancing uh, give you the ability to have, uh, you know, some, some risk with great diversification because those two things are relatively uncorrelated. And then the two other factors are the small factor and the value factor. Mm -hmm. And so you have those four factors working in uh, maybe five, if you count the two fixed income factors, in almost every portfolio we recommend. Good, thank you. Uh, see, uh, I would. Catherine says I would like to uh, do market timing. Also, she, I would like to also do market timing with half of my investments. How do I find someone to do that for me? And the reason they said also is because. Our portfolio, the one that my wife and I agree on, uh, is half buy and hold and half market timing. And the buy and hold portion is half stocks and half bonds. And the stock portion of the buy and hold is half US and half international. And the stock portion is half large and half small. And basically a little more than half value and the balance in growth. So the last, the only other level of diversification that a person could probably use would be uh, in terms of investments and liquid investments is to have some market timing. So I have half using trend following market timing systems. There's, there's nothing sexy about them. There's, they are, they are the most, uh, the lowest risk timing strategies that I know, I have them done by somebody else. It happens to be the old firm that I started. And, and that was what we did for clients was put portfolios together with buy and hold and with timing. But the minimums are relatively high. If you wanted timing, and you don't want to put a lot of money into timing, or even if you do want to put a lot of money into timing, check out Meb Faber, F-A-B-E-R. Uh, he has a series of funds, uh, Cambrian, Cambria funds, uh, and, uh, and they, some of them are buy and hold and timing, some are more timing, but um, he, he does that kind of work, and I think he does uh, a pretty doggone good job. He's very smart. I know, Chris, you've followed his work for years, I think, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. And you you and I met him when we were down in AAII in yeah. Florida. It was yeah. uh, very nice to meet him. He's a nice guy. And uh, I, I, I think you're right that if you're looking for a low cost, low minimum way to do timing, his some of his ETFs would be a really interesting choice. And if you listen to his podcast or read some of his work, he's written some great articles. Uh, one of the big advantages he points out, and I know you've seen this in your own investing, is the, the again, relatively uncorrelated nature of timing to, uh, to value investing. And so uh, it, the combination for you, I'm sure, has smoothed the ride over years, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not that timing always outperforms or that value always outperforms, but um, when you take the two together, the odds of underperforming go down because right. when one's up, the other one tends to be down and vice versa, right? So it's, it's, it's not a bad strategy. It's a good strategy for diversification. It's just less available to most people. Yes, and by the way, the problem with recommending timers is that if you said, could you recommend several uh, uh, people who would do index funds, manage index funds? I would say, 
sure, there's BlackRock, there's Fidelity, there's Vanguard. And I would know that those people who produce those uh, those indexes are going to be pretty doggone close. There's, there's not going to be any meaningful difference between the S&P 500 at BlackRock or Fidelity or at Vanguard. When you start talking about timing, everyone has a different approach. And so it, you can't just say, oh, well, here are six timers who I, I think are doing the same thing. They're not doing the same thing. And so it's much harder to judge timers than it well, is and, to buy and hold. It, it, and I, I think market timing for a lot of people means emotional market timing. It means, yeah. it means discretionary market timing. It means active mutual funds. And that's not at all what you're talking about when you're talking about market timing. And right. it's also not what Meb is talking about. Um, both you and Meb, if, you, if, if somebody asks you, well, how do you know when to be in the market and when to be out of the market, would answer it the same way. You'd say, I don't. The, the algorithm knows and the algorithm doesn't really know a lot of times it gets it wrong but on the average yeah. over the long haul having an automated systematic way to do that timing has historically shown that it clips off you know some significant percentages of the drawdowns yep. and gives you a chance at still having a market rate return so it reduces risk well, well, it doesn't really compromise your return that much, right? But there are times when it dramatically underperforms, right? Just like value. Uh, yes, absolutely. And it's frustrating. Uh, <laughs> Daryl, do you want to add anything to that? Because what is happening right now, as, as we have this important meeting, somebody has decided to wash our windows. <laughs> so so yeah. I think... And I, I had think somebody we must who wanted to get a hold of me. <laughs> yeah. So I'm giving you a shot here, Gerald. What, you're not a market timer. No. And, and, but I do think that, that a lot of people have a misconception about what market timing is for and that they think market timing will, will help, them, help them catch the upswings. And I don't think that's why you should use market timing. I think it's more to avoid the downswings, the down, yeah. drawdowns. Totally. Um, so, as a matter of fact, trend following market timing mm -hmm. is guaranteed not to get in at the bottom. If it gets in at the bottom, it is not trend following, nor does it get out at the top. Right. You can't because the trend hasn't changed yet. Right. And, and you can't make it a one day trend change. You have to you have to try to, to minimize the number of trades during the year. So a lot of the things that people right. would love for market timing to do don't happen but they Not think really, yeah they so yeah well i am i no i can't thank you two enough i have no idea what kind of feedback we're going to get from our viewers and our listeners but i'd like to think that this is something that uh that we can do from time to time just as you two were kind enough to uh go to bat with choose FI and do a, uh, and uh, the AAII and, uh, and do those uh, Zoom and, uh, uh, and, and Facebook presentations. The, and those, those two and three hour presentations are on our website. This will be on our website and hopefully many more of these. Give us some feedback, friends. I know, I know that, that uh, many of you are outspoken um, about you know, what we should be doing. This is a great time to be outspoken. And again, a great time for me to say thank you to Daryl, thank you to Chris, and uh, we'll be back soon uh, with uh, more of the same, but I promise it'll be different. It was All fun. Right? Good to see you, Paul. Nice, nice to, to see, see you. you guys. All right, guys. Take care. Have a good day. If you're thinking about trying a second screen, my experience Don't. says, my experience so far says, bad idea. Bad idea. Yeah. Never mind. Yeah, but I, I'm going to keep trying here for at least a minute or two. If we only get 10 questions because the three of us have things to talk about. Because we just talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm the guilty culprit on that. I know who is. You if, can edit out 
the stuff you don't like. No, we're not going to do that. No. You're not going to edit out the ums and ahs and errs? Nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. Makes I us agree real, right? I <laughs> agree with Paul. Okay. Okay. Gonna, if we do that, it's We're it's one take wonders. It. Yeah. Well, that's that's, right. that'll work. I can do that. Hi, I'm Paul Merriman, and I am joined today by Chris Pedersen, the Director of Marketing. Director of Marketing. <laughs> I'll take whatever you want, Paul. <laughs> no, Just no. keep rolling. <laughs> we aren't going to be that informal. <laughs> God, I need a haircut. That's all right. I, I need hair transplants. Okay. I'll be sure to mention that, that we're all intending to get a haircut soon. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I gotta, there now i got to figure out how to stop this recording. <laughs> And, and pray, Without and pray that it everything actually else. recorded. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. It says we'll just have end to do down it again tomorrow. in the corner. Let's see if I, oh, look, I can pause or I can stop. Let's try stop. <laughs>